Are you aware of what the most shoplifted book in the world is? Ever thought what's the most shoplifted book in the world? Here it is. The Bible. Don't you people shoplift the Bible? Uh, check this sign out here. Show them the next sign. Can you read this from where you are? Are you catching the iron here? December of 2013, uh, McDonald's actually removed their online employee handbook. Uh, it was the section, not the entire thing, it was specifically the section about health. And what they decided to do, oh guys, I put it up way too early, give me a second here. Oh, <laughs> right, I totally messed up my punchline here. That's all right. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, what they did was they, they had, in the, in the section of the, the health section, it said to the, the McDonald's employees, Whatever, you know, do not eat fast food. It's, it's not healthy for you. And they have this picture of a quarter pounder with cheese <laughs> next to it. Irony is, uh, is a huge humor. It's, it's funny, and especially when we think of instances like this. But not all irony is humorous, right? We understand this. Christians who sing of forgiveness but are not very forgiving people. Uh, Christians who receive generously from the Lord, but we have become stingy. That is irony. In our passage this morning in Luke chapter 9, what we are learning that is we're learning about uh, some irony, some ironic situations. Disciples who have received tremendously from the Lord, and yet they don't seem to be as gracious back. In fact, what we learn is that we find out about what it means for Jesus to have graceless followers. In fact, that's the title of our message this morning, Jesus and graceless followers. And here's the thing, is our, our passage shows us that gracelessness is not specifically for people who have just recently uh, come to faith in Christ. It, in fact, it's in this case, it's people who have walked with Jesus. These are his disciples who have been with him now for nearly two years because he's about ready to go to Jerusalem. So this is not people who are uninitiated or unaware. This, these are people, disciples, who have walked with Christ for some time. And what we have find that has happened to them is they have actually stopped listening to Jesus. And what we'll find is this, is that there's four different ways that Jesus responds to his graceless followers. It's embarrassing at times as a not Christian when we find people who aren't even followers of Jesus, but they seem to be more kind and more gracious and more generous and more gentle than even people who call themselves Christians and do not. So I want to show you four different ways that Jesus responds to graceless disciples. I want you to see, first of all, I want to show you some graceless, what I'm going to call graceless unbelief. Uh, the disciples have just come off a their, their literally physical mountaintop experience. They've been on the mount where Jesus has been transfigured, and all that simply means is this. The Bible says that his clothes are radiating, his face is radiating with the glory of God. They've been on a physical, and we would even say this, a spiritual mountaintop experience. And as they're coming off that mountaintop experience, physically and spiritually, look at verse 37. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It, it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. The disciples had just been on their spiritual mountaintop experience, and we won't look at it, but earlier in Luke chapter 9, they had actually been casting demons out. This, this wasn't foreign territory to the disciples. 
But in Matthew and in Mark, uh, Matthew 17 and in Mark 9, we learned that they could not cast this demon out specifically because of their unbelief. Now, Jesus uses a word in verse 41 that immediately, if you were a Jewish person, you would have recognized this word. It is the word twisted. If you have, it was found in verse 41, if you have the NIV in front of you, it's the word perverse. And the reason why a Jewish person would have recognized this word is because Jesus was picking up a quote from Deuteronomy 32. And in Deuteronomy 32, Moses is speaking to the nation of Israel, and he's chastising them because they are living in unbelief. And so I want to read to you Deuteronomy 32. It says, Moses says, they, that is the nation of Israel, have dealt corruptly with them. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Verse 20 of the same chapter reads this way, and God said this time, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. Right? Faith arrives or derives from faithfulness. And so when Jesus is picking up and calls them a twisted and perverse generation, what he's saying is this, you're following the spiritual heritage of your fathers. You're being just like them. You're, you're not doing that. In fact, we, so what he does next then is this, look at verse 42. Jesus does, in verse 42, you read to say, while he was coming, while the boy was coming to Jesus, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. Note that word majesty, at the majesty of God. Because here's what Luke, the author, is doing for us. He's telling us this, that when, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, in verse 32, it says, they became fully awake, they saw Christ's glory. Christ's glory was seen on the Mount by this radiating glow from the glory of the Father, but that the glory of the Father did not stop on the Mount of Transfiguration. It continued how? Uh, when, when Christ came and ministered amongst the people, it came not through a, a radiating glow, but how? Casting out of the demon, and the people saw the majesty of God. This is not the last time, though, that this theme is picked up on. But the Apostle Paul picks up on this very theme in Philippians 2. So think of this. It started off in Deuteronomy 32. You're a faithless and twisted and perverse generation. Why? Because you are not faithful. Jesus says, listen, you can't even cast out demons, which I told you you had the ability to do. You are a faithless and twisted generation. And Paul picks up on this theme in Philippians chapter 2. And he says this. He says that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish, where? In the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. There's a lot to unpack here, but we need to do it quickly. But here's, here's the idea, right? So we're seeing graceless unbelief in his disciples. Paul picks up on this thing and says, listen, now, church, those of you who are followers of Christ, you are to be as light in a, in a world that is dark. What kind of light would that look like? Think about this. All the way back to the Mount of Transfiguration where Christ is radiating the glory of the Father. He comes down in faith and believes and casts out this demon. So what Paul is teaching us in the book of Philippians chapter 2 is that people who reflect the glory and the majesty of God are people who do what? Who hold fast to the word. Which they, the disciples, were not doing Luke chapter 9. So what does Jesus do with people who are demonstrating graceless unbelief? He demonstrates compassion. In this case, by casting out a demon where graceless unbelief resides. I want to show you the second aspect of gracelessness that we see in Jesus' followers. It's, it's found in verse 46. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. I don't know what it, what it was sounding like. Uh, nothing is more 
Christ-like and true humility, and nothing is more serpent-like than pride. I imagine maybe Judas was saying something like this. Well, you know, I'm the greatest because Jesus trusts me with the money bag. I imagine Peter would say something like this. Well, I'm, I'm the greatest because Jesus allowed me to go up on top of the mountain with him. And Thomas says, come on, Peter. We all know the reason why Jesus took you with him. He can't trust you, right? And that's why you're with him. Right? It was an ugly scene for the disciples because they were trying to figure out who was the greatest. And so Jesus has an object lesson. He brings a child up in front of them. Now, this is important for this reason. Uh, the, Jewish, uh, the Jewish rabbis had something called the Talmud. Uh, don't be confused with the Torah. The Torah, the first five books of your Old Testament. The Talmud were, they were rabbinical interpretations or applications. It was kind of the, the history of how Jewish people would typically apply specific passages of Scripture. And in the Talmud, it read this way. That it was, it's considered uh, children to be, uh, if you spent time with children, it would be considered a, a waste of time. So it's not by accident that Jesus brings a child in front of his Jewish disciples who are very familiar with the Talmud, but they have grown up under its teachings. You know, their culture isn't that much different than our culture, right? Our culture teaches us that we find value and greatness by whom we associate with. associate with, you know, uh, the, 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 the folks that are watching the NBA Finals right now, right? So if you can associate with kind of Jay-Z and Beyonce, you must be somewhat of influence. If you can uh, uh, associate with LeBron James, you must be someone of influence. If you can associate with your bosses who are two and three levels and four levels beyond you, if you're invited to their work getaway weekend, you must be a person of influence. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. In my kingdom, that's not the way it is. Greatness is not associated by the great people that you can be around, that you can uh, bring around yourself. Greatness is actually by who you serve. Because he says in verse 48, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me, the Father. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Jesus says you need to spend time with the least. The least don't pay the bills. The, the least won't uh, uh, make people think well of you. In fact, in some cases, the thought may be like this, well, what will people think if that person tags me on their Facebook or on their Instagram feed? I would just say this to us, Christian. If all of our friends are well off, whatever, however you find them, if all our friends are educated, again, however you would define them. If all of our friends are accomplished and the comfortable, then I would suggest that maybe we aren't following Jesus as much as, or to the degree that we think we are. But what the Master would want us to do. So now we see that the disciples are not just showing graceless unbelief, they're showing graceless pride. But the pride doesn't stop there. Maybe they thought they were kind of like, we'll, we'll get away from this topic and let's go to something where Jesus would be happy with us about. Look at verse 49. John answered, and, Master, uh, we saw someone, let me change the subject. Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. And Jesus said, Do not stop him. For the one who is not against you is. For you. He gave them a prohibition. Don't, don't stop them. And then he gave them a principle. That is, the one who is not against you is for you. This graceless pride is demonstrating and pulling itself out in either way. Jesus uh, says to them, listen, no one has a monopoly on me. This is important for us to remember that no person, no church, no denomination as a monopoly on Jesus. It's one of the reasons why we pray for other churches on a weekly basis, because we recognize, well, we're not the only game in town. You drove here, depending on how you came, you 
They're now past some other churches. We aren't the only ones preaching Jesus, whether it's Trinity Bible over here, or the Ark Fellowship, or the Day Spring Community, or right down the road, or Bayou City, Cypress Community, St. John's. All of these are gospel preaching churches. Jesus says, to those who are trying to tribalize my teachings, I will have none of that. My kingdom and my message is much bigger than you and your little group of friends and your little denomination. He says, my, my tribe, Jesus' tribe, will not be prideful. And our Savior actually rejects that. This is graceless pride. How does he respond to graceless pride? Jesus describes what true humility looks like. The graceless unbelief and graceless pride that it gets worse. Look at verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, so Peter has already showed up, and now James and John, who were also on the mount, they said, hey, Lord, you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Man, this is, it, gets, it goes from worse to worse, I know that's not good English, all right? Graceless judgment. Jesus displays graciousness where graceless judgment is reserved. Let me explain about these the Samaritans. It wasn't just the Jews who were rejecting Christ's message. It was. It included the Samaritans as well. In Luke chapter 1 through 9, Jesus primarily is ministering in what we would call Galilee. That is the, the north section. I'll show a map uh, next week on that. And now he's moving south toward Jerusalem. And the Samaritans were people who had intermarried with the Assyrians centuries before. The Jews considered the uh, Samaritans to be half Jew and half Gentile. They were racial half-breeds and religious apostates. And they were considered religious apostates because they had their own Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, they had their own. And they had their own mount on which they worshipped. They worshipped on Mount Gerizim. And then they also had their own kind of priestly system. So they had their own rival, uh, everything set up. And so the Jews said, these guys are religious apostates. And what they did actually in their public worship services, the Jews, in the synagogues, they would pray in precatory prayers. You know what a precatory prayer is? It's a prayer of judgment. God, judge this person. They would actually pray, God, will you make sure that the Samaritans never see eternal life? kind-hearted who cursed them back. And as one commentator wrote, the, the Jews and Samaritans regretted that life was so short because there was so much to hate in one another. So much to hate, so little time. And so when John and James ask if they can bring fire down from heaven, probably what they're thinking about is this. They're probably thinking about the prophet Elijah who would call down fire on the prophets of Baal. They have what I call it, kind of a ministry of pyromaniacs. You know what a pyromaniac is? It's a person who's been diagnosed, or well, oftentimes a person with kind of a, a psychological, I don't want to say disease, or uh, something going on where there's something messed up in their mind and they find great delight in burning things to the ground. Well, James and John had a spiritual pyromania. Where they too had a disease, but not of the mind, but of the heart. Seeking to call judgment down upon anyone whom they did not like, especially someone with history. What does Jesus say in verse 55? But he turned and rebuked them. Jesus' disciples had forgotten what his kingdom was to be about. You remember this, right? It was just a few chapters earlier. He had taught them that their kingdom was to be a kingdom where you love your enemies. And you pray for those who despitefully use you. you. You pray for them and you love them so 
so I, I say this, right? I, we understand this, I think we understand this, but for the believer, whether it's racial animosity, political hostility to a person of the other political party, even those where there's economic disparity between classes of people, or even if there's polarity between cultural differences, to the Christian. I am not first and foremost an American Christian. I am not first and foremost a white Christian or a Baptist Christian. I am first and foremost a Christian. And because of that, if Christ and his teachings guide how I think, how I live, how I interact with people, So I would say to us as Christ followers that when you find in your heart, and we all do, if we're honest, a, a spirit of whether it's calling down fire from heaven, or kind of a spirit of judgmentalism, that what has to rush faster than the spirit of judgmentalism is a spirit of prayer, a spirit of love. And if you're predisposed that way, and all of us are to varying degrees. If you're predisposed to that, then you have to work extra hard at loving and praying. At least if you're calling yourself a follower of Christ. It's Jesus is showing graciousness, right? Because he didn't call fire down upon them. He simply rebukes them. And I love verse 55. He turned and rebuked them. I would love, like, Luke, why didn't you add what he said? Come on, man, that would have made some good, great preaching. But he didn't do that. So you have graceless unbelief, the graceless pride, and kind of a, a graceless judgmentalism. And kind of finally, we see that Jesus defines faithfulness where a graceless rebellion reigns. And what we're learning from Luke 9 is this is what does it look like to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus? Well, you're, you're a believing person, you're a humble person, you're a gracious person, and finally we learn that we're, we're committed people, we're, we're committed to Christ's cause, we're committed to Christ's teaching. But our definition of commitment is a lot different than Jesus' de definition of commitment. And Jesus is going to model it, and he's going to teach it. So look at verse 51. I have these phrases underlined. So he hears he's modeling. I just have these four words underlined. He set his face. To go to Jerusalem. You know, you and I know why he's going. Look again in verse 53. His face was set. Like nothing is going to take him off path. So he's modeling what it looks like to be a follower of himself. Now here's the teaching. Verse 57. As they were going along the road, his disciple day, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus simply says to the person, Hey, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. He, he, wants, you, he wants that follower to know that there's going to be discomfort if you follow me. I, I would love to tell you that if you follow Jesus, there is great comfort. I need to be honest with you and tell you that there is great discomfort. I would even put it this way, there's immense discomfort. There's the discomfort of loving difficult people. There's the discomfort of giving until it hurts. There's the discomfort of extending yourself for Christ and His church. There's the discomfort of being out of step with culture. There's the discomfort of not being liked because of following Jesus' teachings. Everyone loves Jesus' teachings to, to love, right? To be identified by love. Everyone, no one's against that. It's when he gives the more exclusivistic teachings of Christ that is what causes the problem for so many. Jesus says, listen, you can follow me, but just so you know, there may be a time or two or more which if you're going to truly follow me, you may not know where you're going to lay your head that evening. Here's the second one. All these important obligations. Look at verse 59. To another he said, follow me. But 
He said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead, leave the dead to bury your own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Does that seem cold-hearted to you that Jesus would say something like that? kind of strikes me that way, just a little bit cold-hearted, and even the next section will we'll kind of come across that way. What exactly is going on here? Remember the Talmud, the kind of the rabbinical interpretations of the Old Testament law. Let me bring that back up. The Talmud actually used the phrase, it read this way, he who is confronted by a dead relative is free from all the commandments stated in the Torah. So, if you were quoting the Shema, which is Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Even if you were in the middle of quoting the Shema, you could stop if a parent, or if, if someone had died. Let me first go and bury my father, especially if it was a parent. You could stop in the middle of it. All other obligations were, were off. You could travel on the Sabbath. You could do whatever. You had to go back and take care of the dead. Apparently, this man's father, whom Jesus has called to follow him, apparently this man's father was elderly and had not deceased. The idea was, Lord, let me, let me first go, and once my father dies, and then I'll follow you. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. The urgency of my message, the urgency of following Christ, the urgency of my kingdom usurps over all other obligations. Friends, you understand that this morning, that your allegiance to Christ and the command of Christ to you to follow Him usurps all other relationships, usurps all other commands. If we put it this way, Jesus would say to you, if He were here standing before you, don't delay for a more convenient time. Place your faith in Christ today. Well, what, what will my husband think? Or what will my kids think? Or what will my ex think? Follow Christ as Jesus is commanding you. Here's the third one in verse 61. And yet another said, uh, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Seems reasonable. And Jesus said to him, no, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Whoa, this seems harsh. I can't even go and say goodbye to my mom and dad. Is that what you're saying? Like, if I find a follow of Jesus, I just gotta... What, what exactly is going on here? Here's what's happening. This, this disciple whom Jesus has called to follow him is, is he's invoking an Old Testament example. The Old Testament example is when Elijah, I don't remember the prophet Elijah, when Elijah goes and finds Elisha and he takes the mantle off his shoulders and he places it on Elisha. And what does Elisha do? Who is following at that very moment? Elisha says, his future boss, Elijah, hey, let me go say goodbye to my parents first. And he does. First Kings chapter 19, you can see he does that. And Jesus takes that same illustration and flips it on this future disciple and says, no, 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 no. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Folks, we have no ability to soften these words or take the edge off them. You cannot reinterpret them, you cannot reimagine them, you cannot rethink them. These are our Lord's words, these are Christ's words. So, you may be in one of two situations, you're like, whoa, this is really harsh or really hard. Or you may be so discouraged right now that you're like, what do I do, right? How does a person, how do you go from the hopelessness of unbelief to a hopefulness of belief? How do you go from haughtiness to humility? You may recognize it. Maybe your spouse has just talked about it. You're a prideful person. You know that? They have talked to you over and over again. It's like, I don't even know how to, how, how do you root that out? It's like, how do you take oxygen out of a room? Have you ever done that? How do I, how do I root pride from my life? How do I take the, the red out of the Kool-Aid? Just a part of who I am. 
How do I go from being a, a harsh person to a gracious person? I mean, if you grew up in the whole life, you grew up in you, you just kind of recognize, boy, I'm really gracious. I've really changed a lot. You may be thinking that way to yourself. I'm going to do the half of what, what you made your home look like. How do you go from feebly following to faithfully following, right? Because the point of Luke 9 is not somehow to kind of use the Bible to kind of beat you over the head. See, like I told you, you're not living up to what you're supposed to. That's not the point. The, the, the point isn't to show us that somehow, man, we, we blew it, right? I mean, all of us know we blew it. We blew it many times over. So how do I move from unbelief to belief? From haughtiness to humility? From harshness to graciousness? From feebly following Christ to faithfully following Christ. In other words, why are Jesus' disciples, why are they a graceless group? I want to show you two verses that will give you the answer to that. Look at Luke 9, verse 35. Remember we talked about the Mount of Transfiguration? There's this cloud that has overcome the mountain. Peter has said, hey, why don't we build you know, something for Moses, something for Elijah, and something for Jesus? And here we have verse 35, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, next three words, listen to him. If that thing didn't come out strong enough, it's going to come out again, look at verse 43. They were all astonished at the majesty of God, but while they were marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears, and what do they do next? They start arguing about who's the greatest, right? How do I go from unbelief to belief? How do I go from pride to humility? Or from uh, harshness to graciousness? Or feebly following to faithfully following? How do I do that? Here is the Bible answer to that. You listen to the words of the living Christ. But we understand this, that listening to the words of the living Christ is not simply about hearing, right? Because there's lots of us that do that. It's about heeding. It's not simply about observing. It's about obeying. It's not about listening. It's about living. So what you need to do to go from unbelief to belief, humility to from pride to humility, Judgmentalism to a spirit of graciousness is you need to obey the words of Christ that you do know. Don't worry about the words that you don't know about. Wherever the Spirit of God has his finger in your heart right now, or in your chest, that's the area that you need to change. That's the area that you need to grow in. And when you do one day, after another day, after another day, after another day, and afternoon, after afternoon, after morning, after morning, and weekend, after weekend, do you know what you have? You have a graveyard saint who is joyful, who is wise, who people want to spend time with. Why? Because they have developed a life of not just listening, but living. Not just hearing, but heeding. Not just observing, but obeying. And I want to give you one more application, and that is this. Closure. If you only knew my life, I've tried my dead little best. As much as I've tried to go from unbelief to belief, as much as I've tried to go from haughtiness to humility or from judgmental to, to gracious or from feebly following to faithfully following, I, I, I just can't do it. So here's the point of the Christian gospel. The Christian gospel says this, that Jesus accomplished what you could not accomplish on your own. The Christian gospel teaches you this. I command you, Jesus says, but I know, I know you well enough. I know that you will not be fully and completely humble until you get to heaven. And so I will live a life perfect for you. I will be perfectly humble for you. 
I will be perfectly gracious. I will be perfectly uh, humble and gracious. I will live that life for you. I will faithfully follow to this degree. I will go to the cross for you. The Christian gospel teaches you this. So I don't know where you may be on the spectrum this afternoon. The, 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 where you may be on the spectrum of belief to unbelief or somewhere in between. But the point of the Christian gospel is this. You cannot work your way to heaven in and of your own self. That Christ was humble for you. That Christ was obedient for you. That Christ was gracious for you. And that he took the wrath and the punishment of God the Father so that you could receive the grace and the mercy of God. Folks, when we look at Luke chapter 9 and we figure out what does it mean to follow Christ and we see ourselves fall so far short, there's only one place that we can look when we fall short. It's not necessarily to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but it's to look to Christ. And in looking to Christ, Christ saves us. And here's the other thing, Christ sanctifies us. May God do that for you and for this church body. Your Father, we would not be graceless followers great shuts followers. We thank you that though we uh, are graceless and stingy, there is a God, a Savior, who is gracious and generous. That though we are haughty, he shows humility. That though we are disobedient, Christ was obedient and set his face to Jerusalem, that he would die in our place, in our stead. so far.